Hello, and welcome to the BSI Education Podcast with me, Matthew Childs. And me, Alan Sellers. Hello, Alan. How are you? I'm good, thanks. And how are you, Matthew? I'm very well, thank you. Now, in these podcasts, our aim is to bring you the stories behind standards and standardisation. In this episode, we focus on how standards are made. Standards are agreements between people on what good looks like. This could be for a product, a service, or a process. And these agreements are very much a group effort. That group is made up of a wide range of people who have an interest in the particular topic and can make a meaningful contribution. Standards makers might be individual experts at the forefront of their field, and they may also be nominated representatives of government, universities, charities, public interest groups, professional bodies, academia, and of course, trade associations. For this episode, our guest is from one of those trade associations. Steve Bramley is Chief Executive of Gambica, the UK trade association for instrumentation, control, automation and laboratory technology. He has over 14 years of trade association experience at Gambica, with previous roles in public affairs and the industrial automation sector. Steve describes how, by participating in standards development, Gambica can shape their industry, influence public policy and develop positive outcomes for society through standards. We really enjoyed our conversation with Steve and we hope you do too. So in this episode of the podcast, we are delighted to be joined by Steve Brambley. Hello, Steve. How are you? I'm very good. Thank you, Matthew. It's excellent to have you on the podcast, Steve. Now, Steve, can you tell us a bit about Gambica? Sure. So uh, Gambica is a trade association. Uh, we're a not-for-profit organisation. We represent uh, industry to the uh, to the outside world. So uh, our industry in particular is uh, the instrumentation, control, automation and laboratory technology. So it's uh, mostly electronics, industrial electronics. We have about 200 members. That is right across the spectrum from the very large multinationals uh, right down to the uh, the small niche SME businesses that uh, supply into the sectors. Uh, and the main thing that we do is to, to represent industry. So we're the voice of industry. Uh, we're a very collaborative organization that tries to call consensus together on behalf of industry. So this could be to government, could be to the media, could be to the market itself or, or, or customers. Uh, passing on things like best practice, we gather data, uh, but in particular, uh, a large part of what we do is technical. So we are helping to create regulation and standards uh, in our industry. They mentioned you described uh, the industry there, there, Steve. In terms of scale, the sort of number and type of of employers and employees that are involved in the industry. Sure. So, so the industry we we, we cover there is about a seven billion uh, turnover industry. Uh, so quite sizable, really. It, it's uh, a very what we call a horizontal industry so we're supplying and enabling lots of other sectors so everybody's quite well aware of things like automotive and aerospace and pharmaceutical as, as vertical segments uh, our, our sector supplies the technology which makes those run so we, we supply all uh, vertical segments with with the technology that helps them uh, innovate uh, manufacture design etc. about half of that is exported which uh, again always surprises people because uh, we often think we, we don't export that much from this country, but uh, in, in, indeed we do. We're very strong in the technology area. Employs about 40,000 people in total. So again, it's quite, quite a large scale. We, we're quite hidden away um, uh, in terms of visibility as a sector, but, uh, but, but really quite, quite a large and important one for the, for the UK. Uh, ourselves, we have about 200 members. Uh, which represents roughly three quarters of the industry as a whole. So we think we're quite representative of, of our industry. Gambica, Steve, you're going to have to tell us, does there, is there a background to that name? Is there a history to that name? There, there is. Uh, we are uh, over 100 years old as, a, as an association. Uh, but Gambica is, is not really a, an acronym we use anymore. It used to stand for a group of associations of manufacturers of British instrumentation control and automation that's easy for you uh, to say steve yeah wow. it's quite 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 a mouthful isn't it uh, so so we don't really use that anymore for a number of reasons uh, one we're not really a group of associations anymore we that's where gambica came from it's it's smaller associations which have come together and to form a form a larger one uh, we're by no means uh, enormous uh, i'll have a team of 10 people in total so but uh, we are uh, large in terms of representation of the industry now, in these podcasts, we're always keen to learn about the standards journeys of our guests. So, Steve, how did you get here? How did you become to be working at Gambica? 
I've been at Gambica for 15 years now. Uh, I'm, I'm currently the, the chief executive uh, where I've been in that role for a couple of years. Uh, before that, I was looking after uh, public affairs for Gambica, so government relations. Uh, and before that, I ran the industrial automation sector. So before I joined Gambica, I worked in the automotive industry. I'm a, an engineer by my background, a mechanical engineer. Uh, I've had numerous roles working for a number of different automotive uh, suppliers, uh, but including uh, logistics management. Uh, I was an industrial engineer and uh, also a production manager and quality director. And you can imagine that in all of those roles, standards has been uh, one of the guiding factors, in particular management standards. So things like ISO 9000 and QS 9000 uh, for, for quality systems, but also things like uh, environmental standards and safety standards too. So very much a, a user of standards, and I was never involved in the, the creation or the influencing of those standards, but uh, certainly used them to, to, to guide the policies, uh, the procedures, and then the way in which we, we conducted our business. So when I moved to Gambica, that was partially because uh, I wanted a, a career change and partially because uh, actually it seemed like uh, a job that uh, fulfilled a lot of different aspects. Uh, it's, it's a very broad role that we, we look after. So that makes it very, very uh, interesting. Uh, things like creating and influencing standards, which is, which is one of the main things that we do. Now, it's been, been very helpful to have been a user and, uh, and understanding why standards matter in the manufacturing world, to then be able to translate that into what's important when you come to create and influence them. Steve, you mentioned there how you've gone on your particular journey from broadly from standards user now to sort of standards influencer and, and shaper. I just wondered, looking back to, to when you were maybe starting your career, you said your career as an engineer, what your perception and your, your feelings were about standards at that point? Yeah, interesting, because I never actually understood the process for how they were created. I, I thought um, you know, something like BSI and, and, and the European International Standards Bodies like SEN, SENELEC and ISO and IEC sort of created these standards somewhere uh, with, with a, uh, like an internal team of experts. Uh, and it's only really by joining Gambica that I became aware that actually these things are created uh, by experts in industry. And it's facilitated by the standard bodies, facilitated by trade associations. But, but in many ways, uh, the most important people are the industry experts working for companies who uh, give their time and their expertise towards helping to shape the standards. And, and, and the really interesting thing is the collaborative approach that it's not, a, uh, it's not done with just one or two uh, experts. It's done with, with teams of experts, uh, quite often globally. Uh, it's pull together expertise, collaborate and create a sort of consensus, what is the best uh, outcome possible for, for industry, but not only for industry, but uh, for society, for users and, and for, for uh, all kinds of establishments, whether that's manufacturing, but also educational and, 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 uh, and consumers. So Steve, you've touched on there a little bit about how, how Gambica is involved in developing standards. We're, we're, in these podcasts, we're, one of the themes we're looking at is how standards are made. So obviously we've, we've, we've invited you on to talk about this from a, a trade association perspective. So maybe if you could just describe some broad terms to begin with, the, the extent of involvement uh, that Gambica has in, in developing standards. How, how do you go about it? So at the sort of a, uh, high level, we're involved predominantly through through BSI as the as the British Standards uh, Institution, but we that creates then a network of uh, European and international standards bodies. The majority of the work we're doing is in committees. So each committee will have uh, at least one, but if not more, standards that it's uh, looking after, and we propose uh, experts into those committees. So it often is experts from our membership, but it can be uh, experts from, from my own team as well. And in that way, we create uh, an industry voice which tries to bring together the different experiences and the different uh, perspectives from manufacturers, large and small. Now, what those experts do then, uh, they're the representative, but they're not the only person involved. They're kind of the, 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 the figurehead that we put forward to sit on the body, but they will then come back to uh, the Gambica working groups where we can involve all of our members 
uh, to have an input. So quite often we will share that knowledge if there's a vote or a particular wording or paragraph that we want to review and we'll share that amongst the whole membership and everybody's got a chance to, to put forward their point of view and then we'll try and form a consensus. So it's not only accessible to sort of larger companies who have uh, teams and teams of experts but the ability for smaller companies to have an input and in that way we get some really good balance uh, across uh, you know the different experiences and what works for, for the industry as a whole rather than what perhaps only works for a few. You mentioned there about the the committees and the standards you're involved with. Can you give us a sense of scale there? How many committees would Gambik be represented of and how, how many standards would you be involved yeah, in any particular year? I think we're, we're, we're one of the larger uh, representative bodies. We have uh, I think, uh, experts on over 100 committees. So uh, I, I don't know if we're, uh, I think we're the second largest actually in BSI. So uh, those 100 committees, each one will have multiple standards they're looking at as well. So uh, I, again, we're, we're an area, um, electrical equipment, electronic equipment has quite a lot of different standards and it, and it cuts across quite a lot of different uh, sectors, which is the reason why we, we're, we're across so many different uh, committees. We also get involved at the strategic level. Uh, so there's, there's a body called uh, ESAC in, in the UK where we put forward, let's say, the, sort of the, the future of, of how we would wish to use standards uh, in the UK and how important they are to, to the future developments because clearly nothing stands still and technology develops very quickly uh, but not only technology but uh, society and, and uh, the needs and you know, things like environmental standards uh, becoming very predominant or use of say uh, electric vehicles uh, so as these things move on we need to be uh, keeping up with, with the curve and making sure the standards keep up with uh, where technology is going. I think it's, you mentioned ESAC there, Steve. I suppose it's, it's worth saying that, that ESAC is the sort of strategic committee at BSI for electrotechnical standards development. You mentioned there about the scale, uh, sort of sitting on 100, uh, 100 committees, which is around 8 10% of, of BSI committees. Um, so it's a, a, a fantastic representation that you have as a, as a trade association. You mentioned that you had 200 members and around 10, 10 members of staff in Gambica. I suppose my question now is, how much time is then spent as a trade association involved in this work? It, it's, it, my impression is it sounds like it's quite significant. It, it is. So out of my team of 10, I've got one person who spends pretty much 100% of uh, their time working in, in this particular area. Four other people who have a, a share of their time uh, working in this area and, and myself uh, quite often involved at the, the strategic level. So it, it is. Um, um, but it, it's a really very important matter for 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 our industry uh, for a number of reasons but the main one being that we're looking to make sure that best practice is uh, put in place is recorded and is set as a standard because that that's a benefit to everybody it's a benefit not only to to, to the manufacturers but it's a benefit to, to the users of equipment and the consumers uh, particularly in areas like electrical safety uh, or let's say environmental impacts energy efficiency these things are of a, a sort of mutual benefit to everybody to get them right. So Steve, Gambica carries the industry voice into standards development and policy development by selecting experts from its membership. I'm just interested in, in what an expert looks like or, or what they have to have achieved to be known as an expert and involved in that development process. The main thing is experience. Uh, so when, when we're Either the standards committees will do a call for experts or we will uh, have members who wish to put forward experts. Uh, the process really is for them to submit uh, a CV and, and uh, a series of demonstrations of what their, their relevant experience in the field is. And, and really, you know, when we talk about experience, quite often uh, we might think that means uh, someone who's done 40 years uh, in, in the industry. Uh, and quite often that is the case, in fact. But it's not only it's not the exclusive. Um, as we said, technology moves on and, and things happen, and, and uh, we also need people who've got recent experience of, of innovation and development. Because standards is not only about capturing uh, what has happened, but it's about capturing what's coming, uh, and that, that's really quite important. I think that's a really important point you've raised there, Steve. Because obviously the, the next generation of experts is is very important too 
to the work we we, we do at BSI Education and, and BSI and and standards bodies and obviously uh, organisations that are involved in standards development. I presume that is something very important for for Gambica too about bringing forth that next generation of experts. It's critical. We we try very hard to encourage uh, what we call uh, young engineers. There's, there's an IEC uh, Young Professionals program which which helps to uh, let's say put forward a a reason why people might want to get involved and learn more about that um, and, and Alan I know you your, your background is to, to have come through that program yourself uh, it's really critical to, to uh, you know we've got a, a, a population within the engineering community uh, which many people have done uh, 40 years of, of work but eventually they're going to have to retire uh, and when those people retire we need the the next generation to, to to pick up the baton and, and you can't pick up the baton at the point of retirement it needs to happen much earlier than that and, and uh, as i said i think it, it, the more we can encourage uh, younger engineers people in early stage career to start getting involved in the standards process uh, the better it will be in terms of taking their enthusiasm taking their ideas and innovative uh, approaches uh, into the standards uh, process to make sure that what comes out of the other end the, the written document uh, is the best it possibly can be and, and future proof as well I think. Yeah, I, I have to say Steve that on a personal note Gambica has had a, a lot to do with getting me to the point where I am today in the world of standards and one of the things I, I have learned is that it is the experience that you have of where a standard can make a difference that's important rather than the perception of having achieved certain things so if you have that relevant experience then then that is really important in this development process as you say because it it brings information in that might not have previously existed and, and that could have been just you know a year or six months of experience it doesn't have to be the, the 40 years of, of, of qualifying to uh, to say you're an expert at this point because uh, experts are not necessarily uh, time served but uh, a, a perhaps had a quite an intense experience uh, over a short period of time and then you know they know an enormous amount about uh, the topic that they're involved in. I just wonder how successful you feel uh, the sector or industry is at that at the moment you've mentioned the the ICM professionals program and and Gambica being fully aware of, of the need to bring forward that next generation but do you think as a as a standards community we are we are doing as well as we could do? I don't want to be overly critical because uh, to a certain degree uh, there's, there's more factors than, than BSI can influence uh, entirely by itself. I, I think traditionally you know, lots of experts are the ones that have had a great deal of experience but, but also perhaps come from a, a generation where industry itself uh, had a different model. Lots of modern industries has been lots of leaning lots of uh, and when, when I mean leaning I mean uh, you know, t t taking out everything possible to, to make the, the, the businesses as, as productive and as competitive as possible uh, and to some degrees that means that the industry has has itself uh, reduced the amount of expertise uh, that's available in, in any particular company the, the other issue we face is, is internationalization will often make businesses uh, very global it's you know modern technology and, and communications has meant that people can can live and work all over the world and collaborate together which is great it doesn't necessarily mean that uh, experts have, have stayed in the uk uh, where we've got international companies uh, i think again perhaps this uh, more, more recent experience of, of many people working uh, online and collaborating online might actually enable the ability for the standards process uh, to, to, to engage more people if they don't have to necessarily travel physically uh, to meet him. So that, that, could, that could be quite an interesting way of, of, of finding out uh, if we can engage uh, an even broader community than we've been able to so far. I think you're right to raise that, Steve. Obviously, we're recording this during the, well, we're still experiencing the effects of, of COVID-19 as a global pandemic. Uh, in a previous podcast, in episode four of the podcast, we we interviewed uh, colleagues who were talking about uh, the standards world responding to to those challenges and to developing consensus in a very short space of time in an agile way to respond to the to the world around them so i think you've raised a very important point there about trying to find creative ways in which you can bring those new voices and perspectives into into developing guidance and, and standards documents yeah i mean if, if i look at what we 
my experience in Gambico over the 15 years, uh, uh, most of that the standards committees have met physically. And as, as we've talked about, it's a very good thing that it is, uh, there is global collaboration and harmonization of standards across uh, international trade borders. That, that's, that's a very good thing, for, again, for both industry and consumers. Uh, but it's expensive. Um, you know, and if you've got meetings uh, that, that happen in the US and then they happen in China and then the next one's in Australia, that, that's really quite an expensive uh, thing, both in times of money and, and time. Uh, and, and again, often uh, perhaps younger em employees who might, might not uh, be as junior or just don't have the budget to, to, to attend these things, that can be a restriction. So I, I, I'm really interested to see how a more open approach to, to doing these things online might uh, might actually enable uh, businesses to get involved that perhaps couldn't justify it in the first place or, or individuals. And Steve, you described nicely for us uh, how Gambica is involved and some of the challenges there of of ensuring that experts are represented in those in those standards committees and in the, in those conversations to develop consensus. I'm interested now in the in the why you do it. You've touched on the ability to, to shape and influence and have impact. But example, can you give us examples of where of standards where Gambica has made that difference, how it has shaped the development of those particular standards and therefore shaping shaping the development of, of the sector as you describe? Sure. I mean there's there's a very broad range uh, as we've talked about earlier, of standards that we're involved in. A lot of them are electrical safety standards. So uh, we're, we're making sure that, that products function to the highest possible standard. In, in almost all cases, we're raising a bar here. Uh, standards are, are about making sure that best practice is, is documented, uh, sometimes minimum best practice, and then, and then it's up to competitive elements in companies to go, to go beyond that. But, but it, it sort of raises the bar for everybody make sure that internationally the, the standards are raised uh, and when we talk about electrical product safety that, that can be you know the consequences of getting that wrong can be can be quite bad so it, it is it is quite important that that happens one of the examples i can give is where we are looking at a standard at the moment which is uh, looking at the equipment that's used in education by children and making sure that that is is absolutely as safe as possible so it might not sound like a typical standard uh, you would think industry would get involved in. Uh, but in many cases, the, the reason for getting involved in them is to make sure that all actors around the world are, are trying to, to reach the same levels of standards. Um, and in this particular case, if we're looking at raising the standards for education equipment, uh, we're, we're trying to protect uh, predominantly children, uh, but also the teaching staff in, in the educational establishment by making sure the equipment that's provided to them uh, is, is not risky. And of course, primarily, that's to make sure that there's no, uh, no harm done. But, but equally, it's important for manufacturers to make sure that they know the environment they're providing into uh, might have some specific and, and needs that are not the ones typically you might find in, a, in an industrial uh, setting, where you've perhaps got more experienced people or people who understand exactly what different colors or different shapes mean uh, and when it comes to children using it you have to design it uh, in a way which, which is much more uh, intuitive or, or, or obvious uh, and safeguarded in the way that you know, curious children can't uh, accidentally uh, cause a problem by by pressing a, I don't know, a series of buttons or, or whatever it might be so uh, I think it's a good example there of, of, of why it's important to to look at standards not just around the products but their uses as well so we, we've talked about the electrical safety standards and the international development organisations that, that work on developing those standards. And it, it sounds like there's a really important international collaborative element to the work that Gambik is involved with. Would you like to explain a bit more about that, Steve? So harmonisation of standards is something we talk about quite a lot. And it's, it's, it's a very strong goal for us as an industry body. And there's two reasons really why, why that's important. When, when, I mean, when I talk about harmonization, what I mean is making sure that standards uh, are aligned, if not uh, identical, is, is the ideal, uh, around the world in various uh, trading zones. Um, so why would the manufacturers uh, care about that? Well, most manufacturers are uh, exporting and shipping internationally or, or manufacturing in various places around the world. Uh, and, and it makes much more sense to make one product which can be placed on multiple markets 
uh, that's from a manufacturing efficiency point of view. Uh, but also, if you add more complexity, if, if you have to have you know, 10 or 15 different product variants to, to match different uh, zones of the world, then there's more chances of uh, those things going wrong. Uh, and equally, you know, it's testing and compliance is quite an important part. And if you've got to test and make compliant 15 products, it's going to add cost, which is initially will you know, inevitably add cost for the consumer. But there's a more important consumer benefit uh, to that as well, which is you know, we live in a world with a global marketplace. We have Amazon and eBay and other uh, global marketplaces. It's easy now to buy products uh, from all around the world. If there were 15 variants of the same uh, electrical product, you don't want to have to work out which one is the right one for you, or am I, am I buying what I thought was the right one for my zone and, and actually it's a different one? Uh, and, and the problem can be things like voltages and, and current and, and, and uh, protection mechanisms, which mean that accidentally a consumer can buy a product which is not correct for their particular zone. So by, by harmonizing the standards, we're, we're trying to make sure that the, you know, the, the global market has a global standard. I can imagine as well, Steve, that it, it's important that when you're looking at automation and um, process controlled equipment that might be going into factories that they can all talk to each other as well in in a similar way because that that again must be harmonized in some way at an international level yes and no i mean it's it's, it's an absolute important goal uh, but we can look back over over history and, and and see uh in manufacturing multiple competing protocols for for communications uh, we can look back at things like for, for, the, for the the older amongst us, things like uh, VHS and Betamax video uh, and various competing technology platforms where sometimes the consumer can see a benefit in choice, but other times it, it gets really frustrating when uh, one of your devices won't talk to the other device because the manufacturers refuse to allow those two, two competing platforms to, to, to talk to. And so the same thing happens in, in industry. And, and as we go to an increasingly digitalized world and, and uh, things like Industry 4 and smart manufacturing mean that, in, yes, we want to have more devices talking to each other, more machines, more factories, more sites, uh, the logistics part of it, uh, all joined up and communicating. So interoperability is really quite a key, key word here. And standards is one of the vehicles for making sure that happens uh, and that you don't get uh, competing protocols with which, which won't match with each other and cause a frustration for the uh, for the user. Steve, you mentioned there about collaboration, sort of being at the being collaborative at the core of what of what Gambica does in terms of across countries and with government and industry. Uh, I just wonder what's what's next for Gambica. Are there any other collaborations you're currently working on? Yes, we've just started uh, a, a new venture, uh, which is to bring together the world of academia and industry. And and whilst there's been many links between between those two areas for, for a very long time. Uh, we're trying to do it in a, a way in which we bring benefit, not just uh, to those organizations themselves, but to, to the people within them. And well, what I mean by that is the, the, the students, the, the undergraduates, the postgraduates, and those going into their careers. So we're looking to try and make the link stronger on a broad basis between uh, universities who uh, have students which they want to make sure are being educated with the latest uh, information, uh, using the latest uh, technology and equipment and data, uh, and being as employable as possible when they come out of the, those establishments. Uh, and an industry which has got you know, an amount of equipment and an amount of uh, resources that it, it can use, but, but needs to be able to understand how it can shape and influence uh, the process of, of education to make sure that again the the students coming out are, are are as employable as possible so that's what we're looking to to try and achieve and i think that you know, standards has a role in that as well we started it just purely from the, the sort of the education and placement idea but the more we've talked about it with universities uh the more they're interested in things like standards and policy uh because those things ultimately shape the way in which you know, the industry will be going so it's, it's, it's been, I think, traditionally quite difficult um, to teach and give an appraisal of the standards process, for example, in, in, during the education. One of the things we want to really try and do is to, to make sure that education doesn't exist uh, in a vacuum 
and that uh, things like work experience and placements can be done throughout education by by linking our members with the educational establishments to make sure that you know whether it's formalized uh, apprenticeship type of stuff or whether it's just uh, summer work and experience that that, that 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 level of experience can be an important part of going back into the education process and, and taking the experience with you uh, enhancing the learning I think it's really great to hear actually Steve about the about that university industry collaboration just to another plug for a previous podcast episode uh, Alan and I had a great conversation with Irina Brass from UCL on her work uh, in teaching and and research around standards and made that very point about that relationship between uh, standards regulation and and public policy impact uh, and that collaboration between between government and industry um, absolutely vital uh, in order to equip well, equip that next generation of industry experts, whether they become standards makers or whatever professional practice or industry that they, they go into. So is there any way they can find out, uh, people can find out more about uh, about your university industry collaboration? Um, yes, absolutely. On on our uh, website, uh, gambeaker.org.uk, uh, pretty much on the front page, I think you'll, you'll see uh, an event we've got coming up in September, which is uh, it's a conference to, to discuss this, this very thing and, and try and create the mechanisms by which we'll enable this this collaboration between the areas of academia and industry so uh very very happy for people to get involved in that uh otherwise um you know website is just a a window but uh we're very happy to have the conversations so uh, you'll find all the contact details on our website and very happy to uh, to talk to anybody about how they would either like to get involved or partner or, or or just find out more before we finish, I just want to say that to find out more about BSI education, go to www.bsigroup.com forward slash education. This link and others on the themes of this episode can be found in the episode notes. Do please rate and review us wherever you get your podcasts and share us on social media using the hashtag BSI EdPod. And if you have any comments, suggestions, questions or ideas for future podcasts, then do please get in touch at education at bsigroup.com. We welcome your feedback. All that remains is for me to say thank you, Steve. No, thank you. I really enjoyed that. Thank you, Alan. Thank you both. And of course, to thank you for listening.